Hey everyone, Connor Wander here with the Straight From A Scientist podcast, bringing you another video episode. So again, if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, that's Straight From A Scientist, and you'll get the full uh, spectrum of content there. And so this is our second video episode. This was an on-site interview here in one of the libraries at UNC Chapel Hill, and I interviewed Letitia Mayru, who is a fourth year graduate student like myself. She's in the Gillian School of Public Health and Department of Nutrition. And her research is really, really neat. Uh, something that um, brings in a lot of topics that you probably heard of in science, but uh, in a context that, of course, no one else is really looking at. And that's kind of the point of graduate school, right? So we talked about her studies, which um, somewhat briefly are diabetes, maternal diabetes specifically, and its effect on placental epigenetics. So what Letitia is basically looking at are all of the changes in gene expression that might happen um, when a pregnant mother gets diabetes, um, which is actually pretty common. Um, so I learned a lot, and you will as well. Go and check it out, and I'll, I'll let Letitia do all the talking. My audio does cut out a little bit, and I apologize for that. Um, I was trying to reduce some of the echo in the room, but Letitia's audio is flawless, and you know she's really the one that you're coming here to listen to anyways so <laughs> enjoy um and give me any feedback on these on these video episodes uh would love to hear it if you like it and um and if you don't like it let me know as well because they do take a little extra work to set up and no one cares uh i'll go back to regular audio anyways Welcome everyone. Straight from a scientist podcast here. I'm here with Letitia Meru. Did I say that? It's kind of okay. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, who's a doctor, a doctoral student, uh, PhD student such as myself in the Department of Nutrition um, and the Gilling School of Public Health here at UNC. So she was in the neighborhood, of course, and we decided to have her on. We're going to chat about uh, maternal diabetes and placental epigenetics. Thank you, Letitia. Thanks so much. Thanks for So I found your research um, really interesting because I hadn't thought about this. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, now we're going to have to break this stuff down because you mentioned you study basically the epigenetics of the placenta. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought of the placenta, of, I would compare it to bulk of a chicken egg, but I don't know if that's really accurate. Always thought of it that way. Yeah, I think it's a bit more complicated, particularly like with mammals, considering right. that it's still within another body like the yeah. mom's body right <laughs> so it serves a lot of immune function as well as endocrine function and like controls a lot of the pregnancy but typically the way we describe the placenta is the not only like, like the, the barrier between mom and baby but also like the middle man the middle right. guy and so the placenta is responsible for exchanging things between mom and baby so anything the baby needs from mom goes through the placenta and anything the baby produces that's waste goes back to the mom and the mom gets rid of it and metabolizes it or whatever um and it's and a lot of people like to think as well that the placenta is supposed to be like i said act as a barrier um so there are some toxins that the placenta is able to metabolize before it's able to get to the baby but unfortunately for the most part um, a lot of that is not well described and we don't know actually to what extent the placenta actually protects the baby from different toxins um, the, the one, one example, example I can give, and this is just because I've slightly worked on this, is, uh, for example, heavy metals. So things like arsenic and mercury and lead all go through the placenta. So that's why they're really dangerous for fetal <laughs> health. And that's why there's like a lot of research going on, even at the Gilling School of Public Health, about um, arsenic in well water and all that stuff. But for example, uh, one metal that's been pretty well characterized is cadmium. Um, which is another heavy metal. And the reason that it's been pretty well studied is because women who smoke um, have a tendency to build up cadmium and they've noticed that the placenta actually stops it. And so the placenta will have relatively high levels of cadmium in comparison to other metals, even if there's high exposure. Okay, so it's it does way more than a yolk sac. I mean, not only is it really good for, it is good for like nutrient right. um, availability and stuff. And that's kind of my base understanding right. of it. Uh, but it's, I guess, a highway, right. would you say, between uh, the mother and, and the child. I've also heard that 
stem cells can cross from the baby into the mother find those later in life Ooh, is that, I not know that. okay uh, we'll have to look that one i'm not sure because that was really astounding you know i think about um you know the possibility of the baby altering biology right. versus right think of it now. right no there are definitely cool. things you can pick up in the mom in the blood but definitely needs to be further looked up because there are I things think- like they call it fetal nucleated cells or something along those lines and so some people have done research into that because there are things about the baby that gets into the mom and that and because people are not a fan of you obviously pricking their babies during pregnancy (laughs) understandably but we still want to be able to find ways to measure things some people have looked into that but there's not a whole lot and the research that there exists right now still needs to be further studied because it's still pretty much a new sort of biomarker that people are not really sure what it means what it represents, all that different stuff. But there's definitely a huge exchange between mom and baby. So let's, I guess, dive into epigenetics yeah. real quick, and then we can maybe right. bridge the gap, right? right. So you're studying uh, placental epigenetics. Now, again, my understanding of epigenetics, not being my primary research thing, is that it's uh, a change in kind of DNA access. So people think of our genes as being very static. We have our base pairs, and it codes the gene. But then those genes might not actually get read, kind of like pulling a library book off of a shelf, unless you have this epigenetic uh, factor working in your favor. Right. It'll keep it on the shelf if it's working against you. Um, so that seems really important in development because you could turn on a gene on and off. Um, my dad just asked me about this the other day. If you maybe turn a gene on in the wrong place, could you grow like an arm out of your back or something? Right. And technically, yeah. Maybe not just one gene, but maybe, yeah, you yeah, probably have to be a series yeah, of them. Um, so the placenta has its own epigenome. Is right. that right? It has right. its own profile. Right. right. So it has its own profile. And so you've done a pretty good job, obviously, explaining what epigenetics is. And I guess I'll answer it in sort of the two parts of the first part of like why, what's special about the placenta epigenome, and then second of all, why we're even interested in this in the context of like development. Mm -hmm. So the first part, you know, the placenta is a really interesting organ because it actually has the methylation profile that's resembling that of cancer. And what I mean by that is that most um, most cells that you will measure the epigenetics for. And and when I'm talking about epigenetics, I'm going to talk about DNA methylation because that's what I'm particularly focused on. And so DNA Mm -hmm. methylation is just the little methyl groups that are added, specifically the cytosines, and they're across the genome. Some of them are in more so in specific locations, um, and they all regulate, like you were mentioning, whether a gene is turned on and off. Methylation normally suppresses the transcription. Right. right? So closing that book, putting right. it back on the shelf, saying, we're not going to read this right. right now, we're not going to make it. Right. Or right. I don't know, whatever. But <laughs> yeah, there's other stuff that are also saying that potentially it's a mark to make things more accessible. So it depends where... So it depends where in the gene it's <laughs> methylated. So typically, oh yeah. So typically, the 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 perfect story will say, which there's no such thing in science, but at least the yep, general absolutely. perfect story is that if we're in the region of the gene called the promoter, which is where any sort of transcription factor is binding to then actually read the gene, if it's methylated there, that doesn't allow room for the transcription factor to bind to the, the DNA. So therefore, that gene will not be read, and so that's the perfect story. So, but the problem is that methylation is, we look at it across like a percentage, zero Zero to a hundred. And so it's between certain values that you're not really sure if that's making it inaccessible enough or accessible enough. So it's like, it's really, it's really, (laughs) it's It's not not cut and dry, dry, but at least like a perfect example would be that, that yes, anything that's highly methylated means that the gene will most likely not be read and therefore not expressed is kind of the rule of thumb and you take these kind of methylation fingerprints of all these so how does that actually work i guess we should maybe talk about this studying right are you doing this in like a test tube or in mice Uh, right so i'm actually using human placentas for this study yeah which work at the hospitals and right so i've been um so because i'm in the gilling school of public health and there's the whole focus on global health i've actually been working with a cohort that's out of uh soweto south africa um, and so this is through um, previous collaborations that have been established. And so we've been working with a specific pregnancy cohort and having certain samples sent to us to work with. And so these are actual like tissue punches of the placenta 
that were frozen and then sent to us. And then we started doing all the DNA extraction, RNA extraction, all that stuff. Um, yeah, so that that is good context for that of where <laughs> that is. I just like to visualize what people are doing in the lab and help. So you get these samples. You've never, have you visited any of the patients in South Africa? Yeah, so actually the training grant that I was on, um, I mean, technically the the cohort was done by the time I came to UNC, but um, the training grant I was on helped pay for two internships. And one of the internships I did go to Soweto, South Africa to actually get context and meet the research group, meet my uh, global mentor, who was our main collaborator for this project, and get really sort of an idea of what the environment looks like um, and just what sort of, you know, fun things about the data that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't gone kind of thing. Yeah. So it would definitely... think about the confounding variable. Right. Exactly. Like exactly. Because with any human study, you need to think a little bit farther than just like biology. Right. You yep. need to definitely <laughs> think of the social and economic implications. And everybody lives in a very unique environment. And Soweto is very unique, too, in comparison to other places in the world, for sure. So. In ter is it unique in terms of South Africa or having never been to yeah, South Africa? So, I know. <laughs> so for context, so Johannesburg is one of the largest cities in South Africa. And um, basically during apartheid, um, no black person in South Africa was allowed to live in Johannesburg. And so they were pushed out um, by the laws and the white people of South Africa to live in the what they called townships. And one of the bigger townships was called Soweto. And so it's about 40 minutes outside of South, uh, outside of Johannesburg. And that's where basically like the entire black population of Johannesburg lived. And they would they all, all they would all go, go work, work in Johannesburg and then leave in the evening to to live. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and Soweto is also quite particular because it just um, I mean, back I think this was back. Oh, this will have to be checked, but definitely in the 1900s, for sure, um, there was a lot of mining happening because South Africa ended up being one of the places with the most gold in the world. And so, of course, like people capitalized on that. Um, and so this area in general has a lot of former gold mines as well as other mines, including platinum and other things. And so there's a lot of like um, toxins that are left over from any sort of mining. And just... yeah, so any sort of mining industry leaves a lot of a huge mess behind and so Soweto unfortunately is kind of at the heart of that too so they have unique exposures in that sense mm -hmm. and then in general there are other things like air quality to be thinking about and then also nutrition and other things and anything that's post apartheid is also still yeah so is it appealing to use as a like a kind of sample source because it was once this very unified population i or? mean it's it's interesting from more the perspective that this is a very much understudied population in any sort of human genetics or probably not much access to hospitals medical. so surprisingly the largest uh, uh, hospital in the entire continent of africa is in soweto oh, okay so they uh, so it's, it's logistical yeah well, so it's logistically f easier in yeah. the sense of like there's a really big hospital that has resources that we can actually study the people around that doesn't necessarily mean those people are always benefiting from yeah, that absolutely. but that at least means from a research perspective that we have the resources to do that. And that's also where the research unit that I was working with who focuses on developmental origins of health and disease, they work out of that hospital. Um, so it's in, so there's that part that's really interesting. And then there's also the part that I mentioned that this is a really understudy population. And particularly when you're thinking about maternal health and the spectrum of what that looks like, different populations, that diseases look different, and that includes uh, diabetes during pregnancy. So that's why. Yeah, it was just, um, I don't know when this episode would drop. I was just on another podcast talking about side effects. And um, I mentioned that we had a uh, seminar guest come in the Department of Pharmacology and that African-American populations were kind of ignored in genome-wide association studies. They're basically the way we look at how genes affect, um, in this case, your response to warfarin, right? Coagulation drug and huge um, adverse reactions if you get the wrong dose and yet we're ignoring like a massive population that happens to have a gene that we never picked up in the you know wine association study so it is really important uh, for those wondering like why study some random population in south africa it's for ex this exact reason to be missing something huge that's killing them in mass rates no right and um, i mean you know nowadays we really want to push science to be more diverse of 
diverse and inclusive. So um, there's a lot that we can also talk about, which we maybe that would be for another sort of long conversation, <laughs> sure, yeah. but also the conversations about like what makes a good collaboration, particularly if you're coming from an institution in the United States and going to study people in another country, there's a lot of talks also about how do you do that correctly yeah. without promoting sort of the idea that you're just going in benefiting and nobody gets anything out of it that's actually in that population. So that's definitely um, why it's super important to be very connected to the people who are actually collecting and driving a lot of this research, because after all, it is ultimately the point is to help these populations. It's not just for us to do something scientifically interesting as so well. That probably helps you kind of get out of bed in the morning to meeting this patient. You, know, you are actually fighting for someone instead of publishing right, paper in right, a journal and right. then Yahoo. Act. Right. No, it does help. That's why I like studying humans is from that. Yeah. We haven't gotten to the diabetes yeah, part true. yet. That's true. I've been wondering. Um, so you have this discrete population. Why diabetes instead of maybe heavy, heavy metal exposure? Maybe someone else in the lab is working um, on it too, No, or? so I did do, I looked, so heavy metal exposure is hard to do in the sense that you would need both bl blood from mom placenta and fetal blood and so we only had access to placenta so we we did actually assess the metal levels in the placenta but didn't find i think particularly because of our small sample size which we were only working with about 40 samples we didn't find anything that stood out in particular so we kind of dropped that story just for the pure um fact that there are nothing really to follow up for the time being that doesn't mean it's done but just for the time being um, but we were particularly interested in diabetes um, during pregnancy because this cohort, in being a pregnancy cohort, the point of it was to look at what maternal's health's effect on fetal health mm. um, and to consider that across, um, ideally they wanted to consider that across like not only gestation but after pregnancy, but we only have the inf like the data from during gestation and because they followed them, like did they did lots of ultrasounds, um, so they have a lot of data to look into, basically. And ultimately, the cohort was over a thousand women. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty good. Yeah, it's definitely these are people who know how to do really good lo large cohort studies um, and and gestational diabetes, um, which I will explain is a little different than a lot of other sort of types of diabetes people might be familiar with. So gestational diabetes, which is what I mean when I say maternal diabetes during pregnancy, um, is basically diabetes that develops for the first time during pregnancy. Right, I'd heard about that. Um, one of the lab managers actually for my lab was getting her blood sugar yeah. levels checked. Right. It's, it's a huge concern. It's I had no idea. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge concern. So naturally during pregnancy, women do um, develop insulin resistance. And the reason for that is because the baby's primary source of fuel energy is glucose. And they get that glucose from the mom. And so the mom basically has to create a concentration gradient um, where the glucose will go through the placenta, but you need pretty high levels of glucose in your blood. And the only way to do that is to create an insulin resistance within you so your body's not taking up that glucose. Sacrificing yeah. yourself. For, basically. Yeah, wow. basically. And so the insulin resistance, um, we're not too sure what totally pushes all of that to happen in the first place there's definitely a lot of hormones that the placenta makes that will promote that insulin resistance and there's a lot of other things um including the fact that women do gain weight and so any sort of weight gain does lend to insulin resistance so there's a lot of different factors that lead to that and basically gestational diabetes is when that is abnormal okay when you basically have this insulin resistance that goes a little too far away from what <laughs> is the normal which makes it really complicated to study um, in the sense that the diagnostic criteria for, for it are a little all over the place. Um, and the key point that a lot of people, I think, which is one of the biggest things that people always talk about when they think about gestational diabetes is that it's only diagnosed during the third trimester. So this is the last trimester of pregnancy. Um, and so that basically means there's a period of time that like we don't know whether mm. they have it yet or how much it's affecting the baby or how much it's affecting the mom. Because the reason gestational diabetes is so concerning is not only does it increase the chance for the baby to come out really big and then therefore develop obesity and type 2 diabetes later on in life, it also has negative effects for mom. 
So mom, Imagine, yes. yeah, mom is more likely to develop type two diabetes. And even um, there's a lot of research coming out right now, particularly for cardiovascular disease. Um, it just seems that there's something particularly different about women who develop gestational diabetes during pregnancy and then go on to develop cardiovascular disease. They seem to be more at risk than just women who typically develop type two diabetes. Um, and then go on to have cardiovascular disease. There's something about the gestational diabetes that's increasing their risk or making, I don't know, there's, it's it's still not sorted out, but it's why people are super interested and actually why a lot of research is like actually going the other way instead of focusing on the effects of gestational diabetes on the baby. A lot of people are actually right now studying its effects on mom long-term, so. They like just... Kind of. That's kind of what seems. There seems to be something that goes on beyond just like what we typically think about diabetes um, that we're not sure what that is. And it obviously seems to be the connection between pregnancy and diabetes. There must be some sort of interactive effect that we don't quite know how to parse out yet. The energy demand of creating a whole other... <laughs> yeah, creating a person yeah. inside of a person. You yeah. can imagine those energy demands are just... Different that if a switch is flipped in the wrong direction, um, I'm presuming this would be epigenetic reg regulated, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, the thought, so I guess the way I think about what I'm studying, and I think this will kind of sort of circle back. Yeah. Um, so, I guess to circle back, because I didn't think we totally finished the placenta part Very of the true. story. Yeah, I'm sorry. Totally okay. <laughs> um, I think first to kind of circle back as to why the placenta is such a unique thing to even think about the epigenetics is as i was semi mentioning it's very much like cancer in the sense that it's very generally across the genome very hypomethylated so lacking methylation and that's a and i say that's atypical because most of our other cells whether that's skin muscle they're about 50 percent methylated whereas Placenta and cancer are about 30% methylated. And the reason that both placenta and cancer are methylated so lowly is because they want everything to be expressed. Because the point of cancer, as many of us will probably know, is to grow, 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 grow. You don't want <laughs> things to stop you. And that's yeah. the same with placenta. Placenta has a lot of features of cancer that it has to be invasive. It needs to grow. It needs to primarily, I'm going to emphasize the invasive. And it's also very much... Cancer has to develop a lot of like blood vessels. So mm -hmm. does placenta. The placenta is basically just a big piece of meat with lots of vessels. That doesn't the, want to stop for anything. Yeah, basically, basically. Um, good for the fetus, but. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but bad for mom. But the yeah. whole point of the placenta is to connect that fetal and maternal blood vessel. Um, and so that's why it's very much resembling cancer in that sort of epigenetic and DNA methylation state, I would say. Um, and then why we're even interested in the epigenetics in the first place is ultimately, obviously, we're interested in the fetal part of the story, but because we can't always access those samples, we go to the placenta. And there's, um, so we know that with DNA, whatever you get from mom, like, and dad, that's what you get. And should everything go right, there should be no changes, right? Like, uh, unless there's spontaneous mutations or exposure to radiation, like DNA doesn't change in theory, right? Damage. Right. Like the yeah. But trend. like that, that's, I mean, it's not very unlikely. It does happen, but it just doesn't, that's not what normally happens, right. period. Whereas with epigenetics, there's a point during our development right after we, just before we're an embryo, basically. So we go blastocyte, embryo. So right before we're an embryo, all the DNA methylation marks across the entire genome are removed and then put back on. And so the basically the theory is that should there be anything bad happening, and I mean whether that's you're exposed to a toxin or mom's not feeling well or what have you, there might be some sort of disruption of putting those marks back on correctly. Right. That very early stage. You right, right. And so that's why people are super excited about epigenetics during mm -hmm. development is because of the fact that we know that everything is removed and put back on. And so that increases the chances that something could disrupt something. Um, we don't know. Again, these are just theories still. We don't we we have seen some of this stuff in my mice um, and other sort of uh, animal models, but we haven't been able to totally obviously do this in humans and can't just put them in a Petri dish. But um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's just, but again, yeah. it's still a theory, it's still sort of a general hypothesis. And that's why we're super <laughs> interested in that. And so ultimately, the idea is that if we see changes in the placenta, 
that potentially means that the baby is also epigenetically dysregulated, as I would fancily say. Um, and that's yeah, good. and <laughs> so that's the that's the bigger way to think about it. And ultimately, to sort of like tie the whole thing back up together, is the idea is that you know we know gestational diabetes causes issues in, with the baby. We know that. We know gestational diabetes actually also causes problems in placenta development. Um, it's a little all over the place, but in general, you see bigger placentas um, and a lot of different sort of more micro level changes that I won't get into because they're just really all over the place for a number of reasons. But we know it causes some changes. And we also know, as I was talking about, that the placenta is super important for baby's development. So sort of my idea is that if diabetes is causing all these problems, potentially the way the way that diabetes causes changes in fetal health is through its changes on placenta. And so kind of taking a step back instead of directly thinking about fetal health, thinking about placental health, basically. And so I'm ultimately sort of interested in not only sort of parsing that effect out on like, how does diabetes cause changes in the placenta? But I'm also interested in sort of parsing out like if it does cause changes in the placenta, is it through epigenetics? And if it is through epigenetics, is that epigenetic sort of mark that it leaves on the placenta going to then be related to fetal outcomes, sort of? That's sort of the loop de loop. This means this A <laughs> yeah, connects no. to B, which connects it, to C. It sounds like a lot uh, at first, but right. the way you break it down is great because we, you know, this seems to be so important. It's one uh, highway, but also right. like kind of a barrier right. at the same time. Um, and you don't necessarily know whether those epigenetic changes are going to transfer over right. membrane, I guess, right. if you're familiar with science. Right. <laughs> um, for the people not, it, yeah, it's kind of a dual wall that's semi-permeable. Yeah. I'm doing it term. Yeah. <laughs> so some things come through and some things don't. And yeah, it's kind of crazy that we don't know at all whether those are going to go the way. But epigenetics is a very new field, I have to say. Um, and we're still understanding trying to understand like what methylation, methylation, other right, marks. So right. it can get way more complicated, right. but well, <laughs> you want to graduate. Yeah. So I, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's really, really fascinating. Is there anything that you're really excited about? Any, I, I'm sure you can't tell us like specific results right. so no one scoops right. you. Um, but any thoughts about like where your research is going and like, how are you feeling about it? I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think ultimately, I, one thing I will note is that even though I really like working with humans, it's really hard to get samples. I can imagine. Um, and I mean that particularly um, because the placenta, you have to get it within an hour of delivery to get really good um, DNA. Well, DNA usually is fine, but RNA in particular, because it's basically easy. when the placenta is delivered, it's dead. So like yeah. anything that's dead, everything starts like degrading, falling apart, yeah, falling really, apart really fast. fast. And like um, the things that actually degrade RNA are really high in the placenta towards the end of life. Um, so that's and, why, yeah. <laughs> and RNA, um, for those who aren't super familiar, is kind of like what was being read off the book, right? So we, we can kind of get an indication of what was pulled off the library shelves. We're actually in a library right now. <laughs> um, keep saying library and that is the rna that gets read off into the ether and then actually turns into per um that's really really important and rna is less stable as far as yes dna so yes. it's quite fragile yeah that so you must be really i guess nervous about that time, that time. for sampling right yeah. is there anything you can use to like disqualify i'm sure you have to disqualify something a lot of troubleshooting it's a lot of troubleshooting a lot of troubleshooting so ideally if we can be helped we want it to collect it within the hour um so i think ultimately getting more samples has been a huge struggle and i think that that's a struggle of most peach students who are doing any sort of human work um <laughs> but in general i'm you know i really find this project super interesting and i like the fact that i can kind of visualize how this might be applicable in the future even though it'd be like way way future because a lot of what i'm doing is things that are like hypothesis forming and sure. and testing but we would definitely need to further test some of the stuff i'm doing in other populations but ultimately you know i see this project sort of going in in a sense in letting clinicians in particular sort of know which pregnancies have been particularly affected by maternal diabetes and that the ones and therefore which children they should be particularly wary of and ideally 
have preventative measures to ensure that those kids don't end up developing obesity, type 2 diabetes, and everything like that. So those are the far-fetched goals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but I mean, this could help people not um, just in South Africa, but I mean, the United States yes, kind of yes, has a big uh, yes, diabetes issue. Yes. Are you thinking also about those greater implications and like, probably have to do this whole thing again in, a, in like a U.S. population? Or- so that's, yeah, so that's kind of the goal for sure. But working out the kinks and everything with that. But yeah, ultimately, the goal would be to develop a diabetes signature that's ideally yeah. applicable to all populations. The likelihood of that happening is probably pretty low. But uh, we can always dream, right? Good first step. Yeah, it's yeah, a good you got to start somewhere. You got to start <laughs> somewhere. And then ultimately as well is, is sort of like, you know, parsing out also the general diabetes signature because there's obviously also women out there who have type 2 diabetes and who are pregnant. And there are women out there who have type 1 diabetes who are pregnant. And so are there similarities between yeah. those sort of epigenetic changes? Are there differences? If they are similar, what are they? If they are different, what are they and why? So there's, you know, because each of the diabetes will have, in general, we think of diabetes as like any sort of glucose intol- glucose tolerance like issues, right? In general, like that you're just have really high levels of glucose in your blood and that you're not able to control that. Um, and so, um, and, that, and that's generally what we think about it, but there's a lot more to it than just that basic mm-hmm. level. Um, there's just a lot of physiological changes that end up happening, particularly on how you metabolize energy. Um, it's just, and so there's potentially other differences between these different type of diabetes that we're not necessarily catching. And maybe if we compare sort of all of them, we might be able to parse out, like, is it really like the hyperglycemia? So the high glucose levels that are lending to all these changes, or is it something else? Um, so we actually never went over. Oh, yeah. I bought oh, yeah. type two oh, diabetes. Yeah. I'm sorry, we didn't no, no, really that's... go over diabetes in general. Kind of took that. So, um, yeah, you said basically you can't utilize glucose properly. Right. You can't respond to it in the proper way. Most of that is insulin. It people right. often think. Right. Um. So type one diabetes, and I'm sure you're better than I is something you get when you're young. Type two is something that's kind of yeah. developed or perhaps acquired. Um. Could you tell us a little bit more about those Yeah, differences? for sure. So type 1 diabetes is considered an autoimmune disease at this point, and that's why you get it young, because basically your immune system is attacking the cells in your pancreas that actually produce insulin. And so that means that you are not producing any insulin at that point, and so that's why you, anyone with type 2 diabetes has to take insulin shots, because at, for all intents and purposes, they do not produce any, because they're what we call the beta cells that are in the pancreas that produce them are gone, are gone. Um, And you cannot cure that, at least so far, like you have this for the rest of your life. Type 2 diabetes, for the most part, has always been considered something that you develop over time, like most chronic diseases, so obesity and cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, we're seeing it more in kids, and that has a lot to do with the way uh, we're eating and lack of exercise. And the way type 2 diabetes works is that, um, so you... All, all of us produce insulin unless you have type 1 diabetes or other sort of diseases. All of us naturally produce insulin. And there are certain ways in which um, we can become insulin resistant, meaning that our cells do not respond to that signaling molecule. Because like hormones are signals. They're letting your cells know what to do. And so if your cell um, doesn't respond to insulin, then it doesn't know to take in the glucose. So basically, the signal that lets insulin out is that when you eat, you start metabolizing your food, and then your your glucose levels in your blood spike up. And that's totally normal. And then as your glucose levels spike up, your body responds to that and is like, oh, wow, I'm eating. Uh Uh-huh. Awesome. Okay. Like, I need to bring in this glucose and do something with it. So your insulin is signaled by the glucose to be released. And then the insulin tells all your cells, hi guys, like there's a, dinner there's, time, yeah. there's dinner time is here. You guys should like start taking in the glucose from mm. the blood and start doing whatever you want with it, but do something with it. And so that's what and so that's what ends up happening. But with some people over time, basically that signal to take in the glucose doesn't happen. So their cells are it's like, ignored. oh, yeah. they don't. Yeah, they're like, oh, there could be glucose everywhere. And they're just like, oh, whatever. We don't see it. We don't hear it. It's not around. And that's because they're just not, they see, like, they see the insulin and the insulin's trying to, like, knock on the door and, like, hi, like, I'm here. That means everyone else is here. Like, 
but it, the cell is just not responding to that basically. And so that's, that's why right. you usually see with somebody who doesn't respond to insulin, you also see high levels of glucose. And that's why we diagnose type two diabetes with not usually both now, but like typically everyone usually thinks of it as like you have high levels of glucose. Um, and so the reason why it's curable is because it's, since it's something that's acquired and it's usually acquired and we don't quite know always what ends up messing it up, but we do know that like gaining weight causes a lot of problems with your insulin signaling. We know that lack of exercise, which is obviously tied usually, um, is also bad because your um, skeletal muscle are one of the primary things that take in the most glucose. And so if they're becoming more and more insulin resistant, then that causes a lot of issues. Um, and then there's a lot of age is obviously a primary thing, but we won't go into the rest of those. But basically, um, you can actually um, cure, we'll say, cure yourself <laughs> of, of type 2 diabetes. Um, you just have to make a lot of lifestyle changes. And fortunately, there is a point in time that if you are type 2 diabetic, if you if it is not properly managed, you will reach the point where you no longer make your own insulin. Yes. <laughs> to get after it as soon as possible. Right. right. Now, for gestational diabetes, is that at all similar to type 2, in which mothers can kind of change their lifestyle a little bit to get ahead of it? So, or? No, uh, so the thing with gestational diabetes is because, like I mentioned, it, since it's diagnosed so late in pregnancy, kind of already too late for it's it. pretty much too late. Usually in the U.S., they don't like for women to be on any medication during pregnancy if it can be helped. So most of the time they will just be advised to exercise more and watch what they eat. And other countries, including South Africa, they do sometimes put women on metformin um, should it be bad enough. Uh, and metformin is just a drug that's typically used in type 2 diabetes to help with that insulin resistance. Um, but yeah, otherwise, basically after the baby is born, the gestational diabetes goes away. Always good news. Yeah, <laughs> so it, because basically everything that was causing it is pr primarily gone. Um, so yeah, those are the main differences between all three. Mother has multiple children. Does it like just keep coming back, or it can? Yes, yeah. it, you are more likely to. Uh, it, not only because usually, obviously, you get your old, like you're older because mm -hmm. being age is a huge risk factor for any of these sort of chronic diseases, and then. If you have had gestational diabetes in the past, it usually means. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad someone's yeah. doing this research. Um, you know, you, you learn so much about like at-risk populations and then all of these things. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Grad school has taught me that I know nothing. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. Same, same. <laughs> um, but uh, a little bit about you now. Um, so your work is awesome. But what's your future personally? Yeah, what I'm going to do. Yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Um, One that we hate yeah, having we, asked yeah, <laughs> as always. PhD students. Yeah, I always tell people I don't even know what I'm doing next week. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of different ideas. Um, I do know at least what I don't want to do, which is I... That's a yeah, start. That's yeah, that's a start. I do not want to go into academia. Um, I'm very interested in still conducting research, but not necessarily as a, as a principal investigator or somebody who runs their own lab. Um, I really would love to do research in a hospital if possible. So basically either like helping doctors who are interested in doing research or just working in some sort of clinical research lab, that would be super awesome. I also am super interested in science communication. Um, so that's always something I'm kind of thinking about. Um, I think the main problem is I don't really know what that looks like in the long run and kind of the, yes, yeah, yeah. Really does. Yes. so I think that's kind of the, but I mean, you know, that, I think that's a lot of different jobs regardless. So that's kind yeah. of where I'm at for the time. So we'll see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what year are you, by the way? So I'm a fourth year. Okay, same here. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth year. So it's about that time where we need to start yes. asking those questions of ourselves. Yes. And then... yeah. Every time. Every time. <laughs> um, but you said you, you, know, you mentioned you run a blog or your editor for Nutribytes.org? Dot blog. Dot blog. Okay, dot sorry. Nutribytes.blog. We will toss that in the show notes. Um, yeah, I had no idea it existed. It's awesome. It's uh, basically students like yourself writing all about all of these kind of I don't know buzzword and nutrition things. Right. Right. Um, I noticed that you know some of the things that I've been experimenting with in my own life, like paleo diet right. and fasting, that kind of thing. Explain those and right. um, with citations, with explanations of the science. Really appreciate that. 
have uh, are there any in the pipeline that you want to tease or uh, well, what are your favorites yes yeah, so well all of them are actually come up like we don't know about them until like the week uh, okay yeah. <laughs> so there's no teasers for the time being but i guess i think the most the main thing i will explain about it is just like how it came to be sure, yeah so it was basically uh, me and a fellow cohort member her name is kaylee she and i decided that we were really passionate about science communication and we saw how a lot of graduate students around unc were starting up blogs and we were like well why not us and so we originally started off as nuts and then we ended up finding out about a similar um a graduate student blog but they called themselves oncobites oncobites yeah. and so we learned from them that um there's actually like what they call the bite sites that are all run by graduate students across the u.s and they are focused on different topics so there's like astrobites chem bites yeah, yeah envirobites awesome. <laughs> immunobites and oncobites um and so we decided to basically join this sort of like informal group of bite sites um, as the nutrition one. <laughs> yeah. So it's really cute. It's really fun. Um, we have right now expanded to include um, students from other universities who are in the nutrition department. So we're really excited about having that opportunity expand. Um, and ultimately, our goal is to just kind of like what you're saying, like catch those buzzwords and like really explain because I think nutrition, I think all research has a bad rep in a certain sense when it gets into the media. Uh, but I think nutrition, unfortunately, has one of the worst ones. Probably the worst. I can't think of yeah. anything. Uh, maybe my field, Alzheimer's disease, where everyone's like, oh, oh yeah. we're about to cure it. And, yeah. and of course, it doesn't, it doesn't happen, happen like that. Yeah. So people, Christian, I people mean, are giving some really terrible advice. Yeah. Online. Yeah. And I mean, the a lot of the really popular books like um, Michael Pollan is somebody that comes to mind a lot. He's the one who wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma. He's a food journalist. His books are very, very, very popular. And he is one of the prominent people who is very and he, it's not that he doesn't make good points. It's just that it's a little unfair. Um, but it is true that nutrition research historically has been like very much all over the place in the sense of like, you know, one year fat is good, one year fat right. is bad, one year eggs are good, one year eggs are bad, you know, so I definitely understand where people are coming from. And so that's kind of the point of this blog is to kind of just sort of not only explain why that is, but also explain what we do know, because I think there's a lot of focus on what we don't know, but there are some things in nutrition we have figured out. Yeah. Um, and people need to stop spouting the opposite. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But I definitely understand where like because, you know, everyone eats. So it's yep. every something everyone's interested in. Um, and particularly nowadays when food, particularly in the U.S., is super available to all of us. Making the right choice when we have so much choice yeah. is really hard. So that's kind of well, we are not registered dietitians. So we do not try to give advice on what you should eat. We just hope to inform people to make that decision. But I mean, you're pretty well informed. Right. I mean, graduate students in right. uh, nutrition right. school like doesn't get a whole lot better right. than that. Right. And I also appreciate like how quick they are. Like they're bite sized, right. they're digestible, and yet you find space for the nuance, which. Right. Um, yeah, it's awesome. So we'll uh, we'll toss that in the show notes for everyone, and I highly recommend checking it out. And I'm gonna have to figure out all those other bites right. blogs too, because um, that sounds really. Cool. Yeah. No worries. It's so not only do you do a lot of editing, you said you're reading a lot. Um, are you reading these days? Yeah. So um, I, so I think one of the things that I learned in undergrad that I thought was a shame um, was that I never made time to read because you know everyone gets pretty saturated with textbooks, and I think textbook is where reading the joy of reading goes to Dies. die. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even more so to a certain extent than reading articles, I think because that oh, yeah. textbooks are just never ending. But um, so I basically, after I graduated undergrad, I was just like, you know, I have this degree now, but I still know nothing. Mm. Um, and I just felt like I hadn't been spending a lot of time um, reading books from basically not white people. So I really made it a point from that point forward to really not only read about things that I don't know, like, and what I mean is like the histories of countries I've almost never heard of. Um, and also sp specifically really making an effort to read authors of color um, and get different perspectives on that. And so, um, why did I, I was reading a book yesterday that's really, really good, and I wish I actually remembered the name. But um, but I basically focus on like contemporary fiction or sci-fi or fantasy kind of thing, just like to give your brain a break from the science. <laughs> I'm so bad about that. Yeah. I'm always like trying to, I'm reading something. 
either something useless and like nonsensical right. about video games that I shouldn't right. be reading just to take a break, or it's science articles. So um, right. I need to get back to like, stirring up creativity. Right. Right. No, it's so good. But um, what is a good book that I can definitely read? And I'm not going to, I guess I could talk about the book and then tell you the name of it because I cannot, I for the life of me cannot remember the name of books. I can't, yeah, we can put it in the show notes. Yeah, it's such it. a good book. It's a new book that was just released that was actually recommended to me by someone else. And it serendipitously, I already bought it. And so when he told me I had to read it, I was like, don't you worry. But it's basically this beautiful sort of love story. Um, they don't say specifically where this couple is, but I'm assuming from the description that it's Syria. And it's basically the story of their um, sort of meeting and then also them leaving Syria together and then arriving in this nondescript European country where they talk about that experience. And I'm basically nearing the end of like, you know, how that resolves itself. And it's just like um, it's 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 a it's a really simple story in the sense of like, you know, it's all things we've already heard before if we follow the news. But But it's during the war. It's during the war. It's very recent. It's like happening now. Um, and, but it, it just makes you kind of think a little bit about how that story, um, is not so unique in the sense of like, although it is unique to those people, that story could be like replicated in different populations all over. And they would have very similar things to say, except for the fact that they just come from a different country and a different culture. Yeah. And it just, um, it, the author does a really good job of like, doing that really cool nuance of like both the individual and the fact that this is also like happening all over the world to many different (laughs) people um yeah so it's 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 been really like a really great book um what did i and i also so i read the news maybe like two impressing yeah yeah yeah. so i know a lot of graduate students have decided to like kind of keep like a a block on it and i don't like totally don't blame them i'm like the utter opposite like if i'm not constantly up to date like i'm doing it wrong and i actually found out that the atlantic um i don't know if you know the it's like a newspaper journal yeah Yeah. Yeah. oh yeah so they're awesome and i learned that they do like half off for their subscription for students okay so for a year it's like 30 bucks so i just signed up for it like two weeks ago and i am like little obsessive but but i would really (laughs) yeah Yeah, yeah. but i would really recommend it to any graduate student or anyone out there because um i will forewarn that it is a little left-leaning so if that is not your cup of tea then i totally understand but the reason i particularly like them is because they do a good mix of um not only like news articles but also like op-eds and storytelling sort of things Mm -hmm. and they try to dive into a lot of um just different random things that are happening. Like they talked about like an Airbnb scam that's been happening. Yeah, and they talk about things like, you know, how maybe we're raising our kids not to be empathetic enough and focusing too much on like achievements. Probably. Yeah, so it ranges on the different (laughs) topics that it does. I will forewarn it's not focused on world news, which is the only thing that I will say that it's it's, um, slight. And be the most depressing part. Right, right. So, but if... Otherwise, I would recommend The Economist to everyone, which is more moderate and focuses on world news a bit more if you are interested. Yeah, I, I'm always reading articles from all over. Yeah. Um, I haven't like picked one that I have to... It's, it's hard. It's yeah. hard. I picked, <laughs> I picked those two. I picked The Atlantic for the storytelling aspect of it because sometimes like you don't want to read just like facts, 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 because that's what we spend all day doing, right? And like oh, sometimes yeah. I like just hearing the story of like why someone's thinking this, where they're getting this, like, and just and and then the Economist I think is a little bit more moderate both in its political leaning and also on how it does op eds versus like actual like newspaper like this is we're telling you the actual news and right and since I know nothing about the economy on on top of that they do a really good job of like explaining to like you know the slight lay person like. What things you should be paying attention to and what it means like this like the different dips in the stock market and all this different stuff you know that i guess makes you a well-rounded human being an adult in this day and age but and they don't really give us that much finance no. training here this is really good i have to say tips yes. at unc shout out to them right. Right. a lot more resources than a lot of other schools right right no, i did no, investment no, in, no, in the all. sciences but no, not at all. So definitely we'll give a shout out and say that. Yeah, reading obviously is a big, both in science and outside of science. 
and exercise. You said you were going to the gym. So. Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, practicing what you preach in terms of um, yeah, you know, now the diabetes. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that like for graduate students and just normal people, like, you know, exercise is hard and like getting into a good habit of it is. And there's lots of like, you know, you back talk yourself and there's lots of like, yeah, talking about like, you know, you don't have time for this. You don't have time for that, which is true. Like, I mean, the, it's a miracle whenever you have time, but it's really about prioritizing, I think, and like realizing that your health even though it's fine today, doesn't mean it always is going to be fine. And so you shouldn't let anything take your health away, even grad school, because, yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of people, you know, come to grad school and they're working on their projects to help other people, right? right. And it's kind of like in an airplane, they always tell you, put the oxygen mask over your face first, because you pass out, you can't help the person next to you. Kind of what you need to do in grad school. You have a breakdown because you've been in the lab for 20 hours straight, then aren't going to go well actually probably lose productivity right right i I always tell people that yeah sometimes i do go against it (laughs) for short short periods of time um you know it can't be avoided all the time i'm glad yeah anything else um for the listeners you want to shout out um social links where can people find you ask more questions yeah um i think for social i'll just give you all the little okay. things because my twitter i didn't choose the best twitter handle in the world um, that's okay um but i yeah it was uh for reference the twitter handle is bq impertinent which is a french word so that's why i will yeah i could is, read the yeah. <laughs> you could read the letters out but yeah, yeah we'll just put we'll that in the show notes yeah so twitter preferably and then i can give other contact info as well and then you know, super shout out for the blog Nutribytes. Yeah, absolutely. Check it out. And I think that's the general sort of note, you know, take care of yourselves. Definitely make the time for yourself because no one else will. So, yeah. That's that. Thank you, Letitia. Yeah, thank that's- you. It's been great. Um, cool. Love the show there. Yeah. See you guys.